Uh, welcome everybody here. So this is uh, now Wednesday, September 27. That is correct. That's the correct date. Um, that's the OSC meeting agenda. So here's the link right there. Take a look at that. That's the working document for today. And as normal, what we do in a working document, the idea is there for you to paste all, all your content or any, any stuff that you have done, kind of like your scrum stand up so that uh, we can share the information on everybody's work in there. So please take a look at that. As far as um, uh, team numbers, we've got a little little slouch in our numbers. I mean, the team has grown all together. I, th I would say the review of overall progress so far is we're moving along. I mean, I, th I do think there's a lot of stuff getting done and definitely more than, um, I think more than last year. I mean, more more than before February, before the team started. The idea is that um, like on the wiki right now, there's more contributions, but just about every contribution that's on the wiki, it's all primarily by the development team, which means there's a lot of really relevant on, on the spot, basically uh, critical path related contributions um, as we go forward. So we did, I mean, we did do a lot of good things so far. And um, uh, Connie's going to join us next week for the HR work, but we, we got a really 10 exit. 10 exit is my statement. So like if we're going along in regular progress, um, one thing you can think about is... Um, well, I mean, I get this from the exponential kind of thinking, guys, but um, 10xing it, like in, in business management or in or in development in general, it's easier to improve something 10 times than it is to improve something two times. For two times, you have to, uh, it suffices to do linear thinking to, to kind of make little improvement here and there, but if you're going to 10x it 10 times improvement in something, you have to totally shift your mindset. It's nonlinear. You have to go to a different level. But that's how I like to think, and I like that's how I like the project to think, um, because it's so ambitious to, as far as getting all the goals accomplished. But 10xing the the human resources, the the team. I mean, right now, you know, it's all an experiment. We're learning everything as we go. We we get you know constant growth. Right now, you know, we're a little lower. But the idea is with, with more effective recruiting, that means both team members as well as subject matter experts, which we have not never really focused on. We really got to get more subject matter experts on a team so that any problem is solved really fast. Like, for example, it took me um, like four days to troubleshoot the hydraulic controller in on the brick press. There was a very, very obscure problem that you know I ended up solving. It was actually very obscure. But probably if if we had professional you know professionals who who's worked their whole life in hydraulics SMEs, then we could probably have solved that in a day or two. So um, let me share my screen here and actually um, I see if I can uh, share my my face here. That's that is I today. Oh, let's see. There we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. So if you take a take a look at this, but um, where did I leave off? Ten exit. Keep going. Things are good. So product demos for today. Uh, we'll talk about OSC Linux Microtrack Track workflow video filament maker so the first thing a big you know like a big topic right now is the tractor for the, the event was just got announced so just posted that four weeks ahead of time slide seven is where we're at you know those are the concept slash their semi-technical concept design uh, so it's it, we're in between a concept and, and a real technical drawing here I mean, we do have the actual real parts. A lot of the parts in, in these designs are actually very real. It's not just a BS design, so to say, where you're just catting stuff up randomly. There's real parts in there and things that we know how to build, the idlers, the, the, the track drive, the tracks themselves, those geometries are worked out. The power cube is for real. Even though it's represented as just a cube, that stuff is very much real. And... Um, 
that's where we are right now and, and, the, and the steps to go forward with are working on on just refining the design there's there's a number of details we can put in like like uh, we haven't included anything on the, on the bucket cylinders here we, and we've got just general general geometries I think the geometry of the loader arms has to come forward a little yeah, just it's a little wonky uh, the micro track here in this one that's you know that's relatively decent I mean it's a very simple design the only thing that's missing from that design is the actual um, quick attach cylinder to move the quick attach plate back and forth I'm gonna just show that in FreeCAD where we stand right now uh, and that's of course on um, MicroTrack MasterCAD where do you find it if you go to the uh, tractor construction set 2017 page on the wiki you can download all these files we're keeping them as normal in our part library and our master CAD checklist document but uh, yeah lots of work to be done there and, and the thing there is the prototyping that could be done like that's why I, so Ahmed is back he's um, he's got good internet again but maybe I could check in with you for a second like uh, as we do this design there's certain things we can prototype collaboratively like that's what I was asking you Ahmed if you actually have access to uh, the shop the metal shop where you can actually prototype so Okay. Yeah. Uh, first, that's, uh, uh, I connected today to the internet and I see just a little bit about uh, the prototype. It was uh, excellent, actually. There's a big improvement, especially in the cubic, uh, power cubic. Uh, power but cube? I didn't continue focusing on the other parts. But I'll uh, try again to, uh, to focus to every detailed uh, part to, to set again what is, uh, what's next, what's missing. Okay, so tell me, uh, let's let's back up there a little bit. So, so what are you saying? You, are you talking about CAD work? Did you actually? Are you talking about the three D printer or the tractor? No tractor. Tractor. Okay, so on the tractor, what have you done that so far? I have checked the the power cube, uh, the new power cube. This one right here, the seventeen point oh eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's excellent actually. Uh, while it uh, we will have when we set it, we will have a little bit uh, hard for accessibility for the hydraulic pump if we need to maintain it. Uh -huh. But it's okay; um, it can be managed. Uh, however, the, the the fast connection set for the uh, you can say you can say it, yeah for the stopper for sorry uh, the fast connection for the attachment. Uh, I didn't check it really until now. But I'll try, today I'll try uh, okay. to focus on this part before. Yeah, there's no detail there, but the question is like we should really, uh, you know, uh, get very specific on what to do there. So the, like, for example, as the, let's let's take one thing at a time. So say the power cube right here, let's do perspective view here. So this is the thing that we have built and it, it works. It's pretty good. I mean, the geometry is really tight and the size is small. It's like 20 by 20 by 30 inches. But, um, you know, there's details there that we can, we can do. Now, as far as, um, do we have any ideas of, because we are considering that, that build in Saudi Arabia. So any, any details on, on any possible dates that you can fill us in or what's, what's the latest uh, for, there? Uh, for Saudi Arabia, I don't know right now, but we are going to, uh, I'm going to know in Egypt right now. I don't know what is the focus right there, but I, at the end of October, I'll be right there again to stand up what is the situation. However, I'll communicate I have, uh, within this week to check what is going on, where is we stand on the workshop, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I have left the company newly, just from two weeks ago. That's okay. why I, uh, I'll focus now for our projects. Okay. okay do, you, do you still have access to a workshop that you can prototype stuff? Yeah. For the exhibit, I can do it in the other workshop outside. It's an easy. Do you but have access? Prototype. Do you have access to a CNC torch table? Yeah. You do. That's excellent. And yes, do you, I know. And you have yeah. access to 3D printers? Yeah, we have built already two or three pieces. Okay. The What's the status of the so as far as the D3D 3D printer? I mean, is that did you guys actually finish prototyping that? Uh, I don't know. I, I I what I know is I have built the frame for five pieces before I leave. 
and uh, for Hashim, he have ordered already the parts from three weeks ago, and it's already there. I think, I think Sarah have uh, have rent all the the parts for the remaining five uh, for the five prototypes, which will be uh, uh, accessible for the men and the whole Saudi Arabia actually. Uh, but is it all put in one set? I don't know. I'm sure that all the parts already is there. I know. It's 100%. Okay. All right. Well, the first thing is you got to document that. So if I look at what's what's your log looking like? My log? Yeah. It's uh, it's flat. I didn't look for a long time. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> so see if you can log it. Can you take? You got some pictures of those frames and all that that you have prototyped? Right. But so, let me, let me okay. is that workshop like in your city where you're? I mean, you have ready access to it. Yeah. Okay. I already, I already cut it on the, on the touch table. Okay. Uh, well, frames. see. Okay. I on touch table. It's not for me. That's awesome. Is that plasma? Plasma torch table? Plasma cutter. Yeah. Plasma it's cutter. Okay. What's the max thickness it can cut? Uh, about I think it tell me thirteen millimeter. Thirteen millimeter. Yeah. yeah. Um, he tested at 15 millimeter. I don't know. He tell me maybe it's max. Maybe he have more, but he didn't test more than 13 before. Yeah, yeah. 13 millimeter is about a half an inch or so uh, for you guys. People always ask why, because we're. I mean, we're still on track to do the as far as the updates of workflow or progress. We're on track to build on the 14th. When is that? The 14th of October for our own torch table. There's a workshop happening. So that's on the schedule. We don't have many people signed up for it. It'll be a prototyping day. But um, we're using OxyFuel Torch. Why? Because OxyFuel, you can easily cut you know, a few inches, three inches, four inches, up to seven inches. Whereas a plasma cutter to do that would be, probably the max of a plasma cutter is maybe like one or two inches, maybe two inches or something. Yeah. Um, yes. But yeah, that's why you want like, cause, cause then we would have to have both plasma and OxyFuel because we do we do want to do cuts in at, at least like two inch thick steel down the road uh, for things like very heavy duty uh, things like like iron worker machines uh, and things like that. For plasma, it's okay, I know, but uh, let me check. Let me check the yeah. accessibility of this machine. Okay. Yeah, let yeah, but not a problem right now. Just a discussion there. Uh, but we are gonna going to in the future. We are gonna open source this the plasma cutter. So. If anyone knows any subject matter experts on power electronics design, send them our way. I mean, one of the one of the things we want to really focus on is is like for I mean, this is for all of you guys, and especially as we're talking about human resources, we want to get all these subject matter experts who are basically just advising like what, an hour per week or so. But as someone who has built this stuff for a lifetime, they can you know we can get through a design in a few hour sessions. So that's the kind of style we want to go. We can have subject matter experts and then us on the team, you know, once we have a design, we can cat it up and stuff like that and do other documentation. That, that, that's the way it should go. I know we haven't really used our subject matter experts as much because it takes time to find them. I mean, to find a really good person like that, you know, first of all, they have to be really smart. I mean, I, I think because a lot of the subject matter experts will be like, well, who are you if you don't know anything about it? You, you have to have a lifetime of experience in it to do what I do. So those kinds of people don't work for us, but a person that does work is a person who's so smart that they think they can, they actually can teach somebody in a very short time. And that's what mastery is. You can actually teach somebody in a short time, not say, oh, that's too complicated. Anyone who says something that's too complicated, I don't think they know their stuff enough. So that's kind of my opinion, how I've been treating um, subject matter expertise issue. But on a power cube, so Ahmed, then uh, if we talk about the, the torch table, um, what we should be doing then is we should collaborate on the on the open source torch table so maybe we can have a separate discussion on that because uh, I mean we're gonna be building it here we've got the tight torch height controller the, the very simple one and stuff like that but there is some some good prototyping to be done there so maybe I can coordinate with you on that and maybe we can set up a meeting can can we do that okay let's do that uh, when, when the time is needed. Yeah, 
uh, we should meet like I don't know I mean if you're available tomorrow for a quick check-in just to see where we are on that because uh, I wanted to run that by you I mean we've started and we've got you know we've got done initial tests and we want to go further okay. with that so are you available say tomorrow at 1 p.m. same time I make it to 2 p.m. Okay. 2 p.m. sounds great to me so I'll put that okay. on the calendar and then then because if you can do that then we can both do it I mean um, that would be great. I mean, we want to tap, we want to leverage the our development team for prototyping work as well, which leads us to another, uh, I'll bring up another topic, <clears throat> and that's the dev kit. So I'm going to start a slide number eight, but dev kit, a low cost set of tools that we can basically, you know, as people are stable and, and you know, real performers on a team, we can send this dev kit out and have it also for sale for others. But something that's like within a thousand dollar budget, but allows you to do just about anything. So, um, let me see. I think I wrote some notes on my log on that. But the idea being the 3D printer being a core of that, you have to have a little you know, some drilling capacity, uh, and also a very very simple welder. Like a, you can do a very simple welder, that um, a simple open source welder. I mean, of course, the welder is something you want to open source as a high priority. Um, and that's that's one of the 50 tools let me see um, I think I wrote some notes on that dev kit and you are talking about the welding machine especially or an automatic one a welding machine that's basically a small MIG welder that for example I mean I'm talking about things like that you can weld 1 8 inch or like 3 millimeters steel just so, so a tiny one that's about a kilowatt of power, but something that you can plug right into a wall, and it's simple power electronics like a, like a buck boost converter, kind of a simple, I don't know anything about this stuff, but, but I know that we can do like with, like even a little Arduino based welder, and then we can 3D print the gun, uh, like a wire feed gun, and it would have basically flux core wire that's readily accessible, but a, but a little high performance uh, welder so that a person could then do things like the like the cutting of the frames themselves like uh, so l let me just write some notes down on that but so, th so that we kind of keep it in our mind because I think uh, one of the big needs that's emerging throughout the project is as you know as people get involved like right now we've been doing all this design work it's all CAD and virtual, but we got to get our hands on <clears throat> real physical activity for those people that are not set up for that. And we want to do that at low cost so we can fund development kids or maybe do something like if we sell a kid, then we can give a kid to a developer, to a proven developer. That would be a really nice thing. So uh, there's, let me just outline a few main points of that because this would be good for everybody. So of course the 3D printer is a core. Um, now, if you have a 3D printer, then that, and then of course the universal axis. Um, but the universal axis, just like we're doing the CNC torch table right now, if you can 3D print the parts and do little metal pieces, you can read, you know, like one and what we'll show that you you guys will see how how simple it can be to build a CNC torch table. Like once you open source it, I mean, um, I think one could build a, you know, maybe a tiny version of it for possibly as little as, I would guess, $300 even, $400. Then you need a torch on top of that. But but I think that some, some could be done. So from a 3D printer core, just like we're doing with what we're doing in a, in a in the roadmap for OSC, you go from a 3D printer to the 3D printed universal axis with larger rods or even the sm s small same rods for a, for a torch table that you're basically automatic, automated movement of a torch. So say you got a torch, I mean a torch will cost you, um, you know, like the bottles are expensive, but, um, you know, once you invest in that, you can have simple torch cutting ability, but so universal axis torch uh, so a one kilowatt like a small flux core MIG welder with 
with a 3D printed gun. And the same like for the for the feeder, for the wire feeder, we can do uh, basically, a, once again, a stepper motor like we use. So you're not using any extra parts. You got a stepper motor in a set here, right? So you, that would be the wire feed. Uh, so the second, the last thing is, and this gets pretty interesting, and I'm convinced this can be done. So then you do a, a, a ceramic print head. So you can print high performance ceramics, things you would have to bake in an oven though. But ceramic print head, meaning a syringe for the 3D printer, right? But with that, you can then do ceramic pieces. So this could, could apply to whether it's cookware, whether it's pots. But the very interesting thing comes in if it's molds for casting. Okay, now how do you do casting? So here's the idea that I'm, I'm telling you this can be done and, and we got to pursue it. So this is called MIG casting. So you've got a 3D printed ceramic form. Stick an, uh, st put a hole in the bottom so you can stick an electrode through it. And then you MIG weld into it. And the MIG weld, if it's a small thing, you know, talking about things that are a cubic inch size or a couple of cubic inch size, you MIG weld into the form and you get a casting. So instead of pouring hot metal, you're MIG welding the hot metal in there. Um, Ahmed, do you think that could be done? I'm telling you it can be done, but do you think it can be done from your experience? Uh, actually, I don't think so. Why okay. not? Uh, why not? First, uh, for the MIG welder, if you want to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a circle. I, I can't explain it exactly in the, as an electrical guy, but it's about the... Uh, Silicon parts and uh, not silicon parts. Uh, I can't imagine. It's a slide and there is a field of electric electronics. Yeah. Uh, cut it with the uh, with the uh, I would cut it with the field. I don't know with the wires coil. Uh, that uh, actually I we tried from long time here in Egypt. <coughs> actually, some people tried to do it, but uh, it didn't work good. You find that, for example, the Italian machine or uh, German machines, which already bought, it's okay, double price, but uh, a smaller uh, capacity, smaller size, and double capacity. Okay, because it's already there is somehow uh, like a technology secret in yeah. this one. That's why, uh, no, but what? So you're welding. saying you took a you took a ceramic form and you tried MIG welding into it to, to create a shape within that cast? Mm, no, I didn't do before. Well, I don't know I what you're think... talking about about electronics. Um, it's about uh, somehow a deep technical one in the uh, in in the machine, but. Uh... I don't, I don't know how that relates about. to the present question, but anyway, that's the idea there. Um, okay. Um, so we got to try that because, okay, so what do you have here, guys? If you got a 3D printer, you can bootstrap to a, to a torch table as a larger implementation. The 3D printer core is also, is also a circuit mill with, you know, like a hundred dollars more in cost. We already did that. We already built a circuit mill and Shane is, he's still work. So Shane is working on a code, like he's doing his own custom code for the CNC circuit mill, the D3D based circuit mill. So, I mean, we're still looking forward to this awesome milling capacity, circuit milling capacity. And we're talking about features like, uh, I mean, very precise features that you can easily mill your, your Arduino boards and things like that. Definitely for 0.1. 0.1 inch feature size, but we're talking about more like uh, I think it was like 0.1 millimeter feature size Which is ridiculously good because the basics of GT2 belts on a 3d printer They get you to 100th positioning accuracy uh, Based on a stepper just the simple stepper drivers We have you get 100th of a millimeter positioning accuracy. So the accuracy is there. It's it's really good but this is the this is the idea here so to produce for a thousand bucks this this crazy capacity based on 3d printing 
then you've got additional a hundred dollars more you got a circuit mill you got say um in a minimal instance uh, i would go for two hundred dollars more and for a cnc torch but head torch not include well torch handle but not tanks not included but just for your reference oxyhydrogen is the future you know like i you generate oxyhydrogen from water that's power electronics um that's not in a set not in this dev kit right now but it will be uh so then the mig welder uh that's gonna be like plus 100 so 100 bucks in parts over what we have already ceramic print head that we can probably execute that for like another 100 bucks or so um I, I would like to find a good open source version of that. I know there's there's really crappy ceramic extruder heads out there that are open source. I don't know if there's any that are truly open source that are really good. Like I know those guys, um, those Italians got that going on there. There's some companies, Evo or something. No, I'm mixing. But I, I saw a really nice ceramic printer that's that's basically hobbyist type but very high quality uh, but that's something we can do now this mid casting deal if you can do that then you're talking about printing printing yourself so somewhat you know quote unquote 3d printing metal parts like little metal gears and other things so out of this prototyping core you can get circuits you can get small hand tools like the cordless drill power power cordless drill construction set kind of deal little gears you can 3d print your your uh, cordless tools if you use like plastic gears you can print polycarbonate say gears they, they could be relatively strong but you want to go to metal for anything that really lasts for a long time but the good thing is you, with if it's 3d printer you can reprint the parts and you're pretty good but with a basic ability to work plastic and metal, like plastic metal composites, like we're doing with a CNC torch table, where you've got the precise parts that are 3D printed, and then you got plates, metal plates that are outside of them to make for more strength, uh, there's a lot you can do. So anyway, that's just a brief intro to the dev kit idea, but we, I think we really want to produce that and for $1,000. And Lex actually brought it up. He's, he's saying, is Lex here? Um... No, Lex is not here. But Lex was talking like he's a programmer, right? So programmers want to get their hands dirty. He said, "Okay, get get me a dev kit. Uh, I need to start prototyping." So a lot of people say that, and they they want a developer's kit where um, we can prototype. So that's that. Oh yeah, and I forgot one thing. If you want to do really solid production in plastic, like a like think about all the plastic goods in a house, which is a ton of them, then you want a filament maker. And the filament maker has got a lot of 3D printed parts, but it's probably a uh, filament maker. It's probably another, I just bought all the parts for the, for the one that we're building this weekend. So you look at page six, that's some of the printed parts but um all the electronics everything else it's probably might be like another three hundred dollars so that's an expensive book. but if you can get ample 3d printing filament that you make yourself you can print anything anything so uh and then i just found out from the tech for trade people they're the guys that talk about the digital blacksmith network so basically the closest thing i heard to an open source product development pipeline they're talking about collaborative development of products that are largely 3D printed in Africa. So that they call it the Digital Blacksmiths Network, Tech for Trade. Just got connected to them. So I'm going to see if they can open source their, their PET. So PET is a common plastic. Uh, they apparently developed a fully open source and robustly proved it uh, filament maker for PET, which is actually harder to make filament with. Uh, because it's something about higher temperature and more sensitivity there. But they apparently have nailed the open source PET filament maker. So we're going to do some tech transfer for straight out of Africa. That'll be good. That's a tech for trade. It's a 
a bunch of white guys working appropriate technology in Africa. I think they're Europeans. Um, but um, that would be good. Like, let's let's see what happens with the film and maker build this weekend. And it's it's actually quite exciting because I mean, you know, we're getting our hands dirty on that and getting the first experience and and getting some some filament made so hopefully we finish that this Sunday so Saturday is the 3d printer build and then Sunday is the filament maker build so it's looking good like all the parts um, they all make sense I just have a couple of questions maybe on electronics but it's pretty much straightforward and by the way really good job guys like going through the um, the master CAD file and the visual bills of material documents it's pretty clear. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. We can use those within the workshop to actually build from because a lot of the explosions, all the details are in there, and our CAD for that is outstanding. So we did a great job on the CAD. Uh, and let's talk about CAD workflows. So Roberto, hot off the press, take a look at this video. Awesome video, free CAD assembly workflow. Using the very simple merge kind of concept, how do you put a whole bunch of parts together to make an assembly like this that you see in the picture? So that's a video. You can click on that. Um, let's add a link to that. Um, excellent video. Super tight. Uh, Roberto, how long did it take you to do that? That's an important point. Was it like um, everything from script writing to finished product? What was it? Like 25 hours? for seven minutes five hours a minute Roberto uh, Roberto can you hear us there uh, maybe if you can uh, pipe in on that slide there but uh, the record for these good quality tight videos like my video on the the freak 101 video one and two I think the word there was um, Four I think it was four four hours per minute Four hours of edit that's and that's four hours of edit after uh, The script was written So maybe altogether like six hours for one minute of video that's kind of what we're looking at it as far as the quality and uh, and Roberto really great job on that none of this is going to waste this is good stuff it really documents a lot of the workflow it's super tight it's worth watching and Roberto you also asked about the language agnostic instructionals video that <clears throat> that might be uh, short-lived no it's not uh, we're building upon we still haven't done much of the language agnostic instructionals but the procedure you've done for that in the video is completely relevant and we'll just be building upon that one of the last things we talked about is this Gundam style instructions, which are these uh, these toys from Japan or Korea or something, where they make these nice instructions that look like they're language agnostic. They have very very few letters and words in there. They do have some Japanese written in there, some stuff I can't read there, but they're a mixture of what we've already documented for language agnostic instructionals in addition to more component of the exploded part drawing so it's a mixture between exploded parts exploded part diagram and language agnostic instructions but really we can get really funky as we master all these workflows between FreeCAD GIMP Inkscape Blender and then putting that into videos um, We've got Brian Beck in the background. He's not officially on a, on a dev team, but he's doing a video uh, instruction on Caden Live. So we're going to add Caden Live, like, re, you know, really getting good at Caden Live. And also some post processing stuff, which is Natron, which is um, compositing software. So that's one, you got video, and then you do special effects and, and post processing, like text and different features, different cool things to make it really professional. That's Natron. Never used it. I know it's out there, it looks great. Another uh, French product. The French guy's got a lot of good products out there, like, for example, Sweet Home. That's another French product out of France. Sweet Home 3D, which is our core for the CD Co Home. Okay, uh, continuing here. So that's the filament maker going to be built. Let's watch the video. Study it in carefully, by the way. 
um, study this video. This is something we have to master. And that's what we already are supposed to be doing with the final assemblies. And this explains a bit about going between the part libraries and final assemblies and so forth. A very simple workflow, not involving a lot of the uh, assembly workbench, just minimal. Because there's another workflow that we will tap later once we get a little better that uses much more of the constraint features and auto update of parts where you can update like all the parts in a in a, in a uh, document but that's a little harder so we don't want to we'll have that too for the more advanced people but for now this this works it's acceptable for simple design that then anyone with minimal training can can do as opposed to having a little bit of a steeper learning curve if you work with the advanced features of the assembly to workbench all right um, what else here this is um, so we're working on how do you do explosions so Roberto's done the lang the ex how to extract isometric views he's got another process to get this only issue with this one is there's a little pixelation there as you see look at the details uh, but it's a different workflow but look at that I mean it's uh, we have to work out how to make this perfect. We can't have this. We we need complete detail, and there might be a way to do that if we just zoom out more and things like that. But we're still working on that. Um, Roberto, any comments? Or, or you can't can't really talk to us right now. All your problems, okay? Uh, but see if you can um, comment on the number five slide about the time it took you, and and we can trace that. All you need to do is actually look at Roberto's log because he's logging well and you can figure out how many hours it took him to do all of this. Um, all right. Leaderboard, gamification. So, no, this is last week. But but if you look at, look at dev log, there's a development team log, there's the leaderboard, the top contributors. Uh, I should be scratched off of that because I do this full time. So I skew this thing. But Michelle... Roberto, Lex, Michael, Altfield, Christian, the top six there. Um, but that's good because we're, we're competing for glory with, with ourselves. Okay, uh, what else to be said? I mentioned the dev kit, OSE ISO, just one comment on that. So, so yeah, I mean the OSE ISO, yeah, it's actually pretty good. I mean, first of all, it's awesome. It's got all, a lot of the software, but definitely still we got to shake down a few issues. The USB stuff doesn't seem to work. Uh, so if you go to OSE Linux, I don't know, Christian, if, have you seen, seen my comments? Any comments? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Oh, you haven't? I think we did. Okay. So I did... Um, I did the full testing of that and just to, to review what's happening right now and it's I'm gonna paste the link into the doc so this is my test results under my name here okay click on that but yeah it's I mean the cool thing about the running it off the USB stick is it's just faster than your install I mean it's amazing so when I <laughs> You know, when I actually booted it up off the USB stick, first of all, I had no problem. It, I used Startup Disk Creator. No problem. It, it did the USB disk in like half hour. And then I just plugged it in and turned my computer on. And it booted off the USB disk automatically. I didn't even have to switch into the boot, boot menu. But it was super fast. And I had to do a double take on it, meaning that when I loaded it, I, I said, whoa, 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 what's going on? Was this maybe the because I used a different computer, I, I thought, is this actually the USB? Because it looked exactly like my uh, my desktop on the the one I'm using right now. I was like, wait a minute, was that maybe installed on a computer already? No, no, it was coming right off the, the USB stick. And basically that whole, when you look at the OSE Linux page, there's, a, there's an icon on the right-hand side there. See that? See this bar here of all that? Well, that's exactly how it appears in the ISO. So, Chris, good job on actually copying that exactly because that's that's kind of the the whole developer stack that we have. FreeCAD, you got your Cura, you got your Arduino, OpenSCAD, Caden Live, VocoScreen, and so forth. A few more programs there. 
but yeah really nice now the only thing is the usb doesn't appear to be working i tried to upload programs to arduino and then to the 3d printer and they didn't work and it, it's it was a replicable problem so we gotta fi fix the usb issue somehow the other issue was the exploded part animation workbench appears to be incomplete that's the that's the other thing and some other minor details but um, yeah. That's the thing about the um, about the USB problem. I, I'm not quite sure because uh, it would be best if you just post that stuff into the into the Excel sheet because otherwise I probably won't get it at some point. And well, yeah, I, I look into there regularly. Okay. But I also put in there anything I think about the, the problems and things. Otherwise, I just will be left out and think everything's fine. Um, yeah. I think this is maybe a thing of the of the driver problem. So, so did you take a look on that? Why the internet oh, yeah. was working with your uh, your laptop? Well, did internet you, uh, internet was perfectly fine this time. It, it just worked on, on both com two computers. So okay. Yeah, that that whatever you did, you fixed it. So I mean, I I didn't do anything really. You but, didn't do anything. Uh, maybe you had an old version. I, I'm not quite sure. But all right, okay. if it works, yeah, I it, don't have anything to add there. Yeah, um, it does work. So, but like well, I was hoping that we can. I don't have any test cases here for for trying. Let's say to put in a USB in here. Yeah, you so do. Maybe... Don't you have a, an Arduino? Ah, right. I have the Arduino. Yeah. Check. Yeah. So, yeah, so the that. next step is maybe. to see if the problem is replicable, and maybe for you other people. Like I, I noticed in the spreadsheet, everyone said that it's working for them try if you if you have an arduino try uploading something to an arduino and see if the usb works or even a thing like i haven't actually checked things like the the video camera because that's a usb video camera uh, just try any usb devices see if they're recognized uh, but yeah christian for you the next step would be plug into an arduino and see if um you get that issue because if you can do that i don't know if you can do it by this weekend i don't know if you have the time but if that's the case, that would be the first time we would use it during a workshop. Because I mean, it's it's sweet. I mean, I almost got to printing with my uh, USB distribution, and it's just amazing because it's faster than my de than my laptop. So it's it's what the way it works from the USB. It's I mean, why is it faster? It's because it's running out of RAM, not out of like partly, but it's it's mainly just because the system is so tidied up. It, there's nothing nothing it, it's kind of like a fresh setup it's like yeah. you would delete your entire disk and set it up and everything that's on there that it's exactly what you see there's no doubt yeah. there's no no waste in there and that that makes it quite fast of course yeah and and when you say no waste you also stuff. when you say no waste do you also mean that there's not like all these files left you know saved all over the place in all kinds of directories yeah sure because it's it's, it's empty right it's, yeah it's, it's empty it's just and that that makes that makes of course some, some performance yeah no it's uh, really nice i mean it's i mean i think i'll just be using that from now on if that's the case because uh it's yeah, just it's, faster it's, yeah, yeah. It, it, it will be at, at at some point especially if you use use be free that, that may be some um uh-huh because otherwise the loading speed will of course be a bit a bit slow but but otherwise if you have used be free it will be probably faster than anything that's not ssd so yeah yeah I, excellent. I can see that um, excellent so uh what what i want to add is um the, the let's let's see uh, so, somebody has posted here with the uh, assembly workbench right um that there's a problem but i'm not, not quite sure if this is actually something we should add or not because we have the assembly two workbench and do we need the assembly one workbench yeah can it's someone explain it because i don't know what that's about we 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 just want assembly two there's the other stuff is isn't that broken or are we saying that the stuff is getting fixed and we want to include that yeah that would be interesting who, who said that uh steven caesar uh, Kai, Kai, steve kaiser, kaiser? Uh, it might know. be yeah I don't know. I mean, the latest, I haven't heard of any news. I think maybe just ignore that for now because all I know is that there's development on Assembly 2 and I I don't, haven't heard much about work from another Assembly workbench. Does anyone know anything more about that? 
If if we don't, then I think we should probably ignore it. I know Steve said that, but Steve did not. He's not. Uh, he hasn't been around Freak so he might have seen that and just said, "Oh, th what's that?" But it's actually the one that's been disused. The the one that's they're not using. I think if that's what this is about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll just text him. Text yeah, him ta ask him, ask him what the deal is if he knows anything. Because the only thing that can be there is the fact that they actually made progress on the other one that was not working, and uh, they might have gotten some fix to that. So, yeah. So I'm just gonna right. send you. Uh, so, so the testing, um, I just sent it to you. the thing is, mm -hmm. yep. as nobody is answering to my Excel sheet questions, I just wanted to, to ask that again. Yeah. Uh, at the bottom, there were two, um, let's say, um, requests. I'm not, co I'm not sure anymore who, who asked them. That were uh, VLC and OBS Studio. Yeah. Are they still, I, I just asked, are they necessary? Do we need them? This yeah. Is, we haven't oh, used, stuff. yeah, I mean, if, does someone use them regularly? I know we want to get to using OBS Studio. That's for doing screencasts where you can capture like a little picture of you in a corner when you're explaining something. That's a nice thing. And OBS Studio in general, that's for studio, like video production work, which is, we will do that. Um, does anyone use that regularly right now? Because we will, we'll add that later. I'm not sure if. You necessarily need to do that right now. And VLC player, yeah, I mean, I guess that is used quite a bit. Um, VLC okay, so player I'll, is I'll used. Add yeah. I'll add both. Yeah, Just no, this. it will be good because we are going to use them definitely. And, and hopefully we keep this manageable, keep it still fast, nice and fast. Uh, it, it will be fast. Uh, I, I'm not, not um, I'm re really convinced about that. The thing is, however, um, when we get above four gigabytes, it may get some messy stuff i i cannot really explain it but it basically has to do with the restrictions of um well of the um of the format that the uh usb live cd is using uh that wants to keep it below four gigabytes uh -huh. that's uh, kind of a restriction it can be uh, overwritten but it's it's kind of messy so mm -hmm. It would be good and it would be reasonable because over four gigabytes is also uh, where where the USB sticks stop to get regular. So um, maybe just stick with that restriction. Yeah. Okay. And the last last thing talking about the USB, we should appreciate how that's done. Do you think you can do? Do you have the capacity to do a little screen capture of of the process of how you actually add, you know, download and change the ISO to add new programs into it? Just a quick overview of that. Can you do a screencast well, on that? I've written a really, really long um, text about that. Um, what right. I did is uh, I know you did. Kind of, how should I say it? It's much in the console, so it's not really fashionable for a uh, for, for video i think it's it's uh -huh. not it, it doesn't look that that enormously great and mm -hmm. it's sometimes really specific so i'm not quite sure if this is really yeah capture worthy like like i said maybe maybe somebody can read somebody who's interested in that can read the um the part that i read uh, that i wrote about it and tell me if this is readable if a video could be uh interesting or not so because there are different steps for example I have to um, set it up on the USB stick before I'm done put that one in a, in a computer and start up with it and then I start to arrange for example the, 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 the taskbar on the left side I have to arrange it by hand and then I save all of that yeah. somewhere in the cloud and, and get that back and let making a video of all of that would get maybe a bit uncoordinated because yeah, I well, had to explain that I mean, as well and the, the idea here is, uh, the deal is, yeah, maybe maybe forget about it for now. What we, what we would need is actually a video team to do that because you now you, you're in the details of that, so you don't, you might not see the whole, you know, kind of like a higher level view, but a documentarian, like a video producer, a director and a team could make a, make a video out of it. I mean, it's more, that is more yeah, conceptual it's, and all that, but it's, 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 it's hard. Possible. It needs a team. 
Yeah, I, but yeah, yeah. It's it's surely possible. I, I I won't I won't disagree on that. But it's uh, no, it's beyond. I, I don't think it's worth the yeah. it's worth the effort. At the right, moment. right. Okay, without that, but we we would want to do that sometime in the future, because the idea there is, um, yeah, you you have to have a person like a, who's really like a like a video producer to to step up above that because because you're in the details, it needs to be translated by a team of people who. Who don't have that like it would be important for somebody who's who's pretty much uh, a novice to to make that video because then they can ask the simple questions I wrote some notes about um, if you look at my log I looked at um, video production protocol because yeah instructional production protocol if you want to take a look at that but that's kind of like um, it's called instructional production protocol on the wiki but it starts to get into like I, for developing the team there's a whole bunch of role descriptions of what needs to all happen in a, once we really define this process and we really have a team where we can go into a subject and do like I, one one good example that does it really well is the Khan Academy they they're really good at doing that I just saw a video on how to make videos from them just amazing level of work and, and you, for that kind of work you need a whole team uh, an editor and producer and technical writer screenwriter and tons of tons of resource to make it happen properly it's a whole art but beyond the scope right now okay um anything else questions comments the next because the next steps on a tractor we, we should talk about some role allocation i see no no questions comments uh, role allocation. We need a couple of things. So the next steps on. Uh, the... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, just, just uh, before I forget it, um, is there anyone out there with driver problems left? Because we had one that has DNS, that had DNS problems. Um, so I was kind of um, a, a bit anxious about that. Is there anything left? Any any kind of problems when when starting it up? It up or is it just with the singular pro programs that we have to adjust. I don't know. Anyone? All right. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So that looks that looks like nobody is um, nobody is crying here. Okay. All right. So <laughs> okay. Um, okay. That's done for me. Okay. okay. So now I can I know what I can work. With. Okay, you can rest in peace and do some the next iteration. Thank you. No, it's really good. If if you do get this in time, we can definitely use it in this weekend's workshop, because we this weekend's workshop we're gonna have a dedicated two-hour session for FreeCAD. So uh, hopefully we can use it on the ISO. If not, well, if we don't, right? For the FreeCAD part we can do, so we can already use it. We what we can't do is do the printer control with it. So. And the other thing, just to mention on that, the .ini file, I could not find it, Christian. Once again, that's in that in my documentation. Um, that should, however, be already initialized because I have oh, yeah? already edited. Huh. So it, when you open up Cura, it should already, should already be have it? adjusted. Oh, okay. Oh, that's well, it should be oh. everything all right. You, you can test it, but um, I've, I've deleted it out of that reason. Okay. I see. Well, thank you. That's That solves that one. Okay, uh, next tasks on the tractor. So a little role division. We'll have, um, you know, we can actually take that meeting for whoever wants to join us on, on um, with Ahmed tomorrow at 2 p.m. But the immediate priorities there like a, would be a bucket, a rototiller, and a, and a mower, three attachments to the plate. Now the plate, the quick attach plate is just, it's not detailed. It, there's a full detail that needs to happen on a quick attach plate. Right now the profile is that of the Bobcat standard, which if you look at the side profile, that's what a Bobcat standard looks like. Something's wrong there too though. That's that's the profile if you look at it from the side. That's how you attach to implements. There's a pin that's missing. There will be a pin that goes in through... Uh, it's like a bar that would lock implements in, but this is the the male part of the quick attach. Now it doesn't have the cylinder or anything, so that needs to be added. Um, I mean, these are technical details, and they they need some attention. So, the, who are the people who are available to do stuff on that? We've got I know Abe, 
um, just to get an overview of who's available to do stuff. Uh, what yeah. roles? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, I, I've been kind of slow with that free cut stuff. I was having a little trouble with some of those tractor parts. I think one thing I might have some questions about is is the clamps, which I haven't got to those yet. I think that the, if I understand the clamps are just small ones that go on the ends of most of the pipes and yeah. they're just clamping on and they're yeah. not uh, being bolted to anything else. That's correct. Uh, but Like, for example, like if you look at the loader arm shafts, they need to be clamped at the at the outer part. Yeah. So if we do the, I, I think a, um, that's I think a person I kind of comparison. Got the yeah. Plate things right, although there's some stuff that's a little bit off, maybe with the tracks and so on, and a little bit. It's hard to adjust some of those things. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. But, um, I'll keep messing with them, and the motors uh, need to be gotten right. And I guess there, there's clamps on the motor. I looked at the old. Uh, uh, one of the old files from the previous track, and there, there was some information there. Uh, it wasn't a complete cat, but uh, it looks like there's clamps that go around the, the motor, and I wasn't sure if that sprocket was quite, if that was necessarily the right size. If that no, there's, the no, as far, hold on a second. On the motor, we're not using, it's a direct couple to the, to that, to that sprocket thing. So there is no clamps there. That this sprocket, the detail there is that it's going to bolt onto the plate. That's this kind of like a wheel mounting plate on a on a motor. So the detail there would be four bolts or five bolt pattern that connects this sprocket to the to this disc that's on a motor. That's that's there. But yeah, this is not. Yeah, it just needs a lot of the detail to be worked out, and uh, that's why I would say. One thing you could do is add the clamps on the arms. That's one item. That's a very specific item. But beyond that, I mean, someone could take... Can anyone take the quick attach and actually make it a technically correct thing? Like, adding details. So that means, uh, if we forget about how it's mounted, maybe don't worry about that. Take what's here already and add the pin. We need a pin to, to lock down the implement. Now, how are we going to do that? I don't know. Um that needs to be figured out it's you kind of have to study it how just to take a look at pictures from all other sources as far as how they do the locking pin there has to be some lever and a pin that locks the implement down um so that's one thing that can be worked on um let's see what are some other specifics we can work on here um i mean i think the the way that you know it's all like dependencies of interface design at this point, I think what can be done is doing the sim the the implements that have a Bobcat standard quick attach on them. So, a bucket bucket with teeth. How do you do a bucket? You just Google online, look at the Bobcat, how they do their buckets, and just draw it up in FreeCAD, but add some teeth. Now, how do you do teeth? We've got that fully documented from like. Um, if you you can even Google the open source tooth bar and probably get our initial work open source tooth bar of course that's classic work but here's an actual technical design of a tooth bar so replicate that it's just a bar we can use like one inch one inch shaft for that one piece and another piece the technical design is drawn up right there so someone can draw that up um, and make a tooth bar Roberto are you are you available to do stuff Josh are you available to do stuff I see you guys are on the on the call here. Um, yeah, R Roberto, maybe you can do 
you can do the tooth bar um, bucket so bucket and, a, and teeth on it what you can do is essentially look at <clears throat> bobcat buckets and that use a bobcat standard so because we define the bobcat standard you don't have to worry about what's here because we know that we're gonna have to make it a bobcat full standard so what you can worry about is the then the part that mates to this has to be the bobcat standard female part now so what i would suggest that's that's actually a big project right there the the bucket itself is easy but adding the detail of the quick attach meaning the male mating part and the female mating part so on the tractor here the micro track we've got the male part the female is what slips over it <clears throat> you just have to google it you know bobcat look at the wiki we have that documented there look at pictures on the web but what I would do is uh, maybe uh, divide that into two parts one Roberto maybe you can take on uh, do the the bucket I mean, just a standard bucket just a standard bucket um, thing that's but the only question is how wide it has to be just as wide as the tractor so just um, so f because our con our thing is 42 inches I think it's 41 inches actually or 42 inches uh, 42 inches make the bucket 42 inches uh, 42 inches for the attachment yeah make it 42 inches so that that's the width typically the bobcat bucket is going to be bigger but get the profile basically look at the it's what you need to do is study how the profile of that bucket looks just its basic geometry and make a nice looking bucket for it uh, just just look at it online like all kinds of variations and make a pretty decent one it we've done like the simple square right angle ones they they're not good because the corner you get stuff stuck in the corner so they want to have this kind of a shape that's like I'll draw that out you for your bucket profile you want a shape that's something like this something to that effect um, there's a cutout on a corner that that's like your that's a real a decent bucket right there and add the tooth bar now Josh the part that goes to mount the bucket itself so you, we know the interface it's Bobcat standard draw the male the female draw the female part of the Bobcat standard does that make sense does or so just that which will be welded onto the bucket or welded onto any implement whatsoever so there'll be a modular part that we will use once you have that we can go with it Josh you think you could do something like that okay let's try it uh, so let's let's do this this is good um, keep going we'll and we'll talk to Ahmed tomorrow at 2 p.m. so if anyone wants to join that join that discussion on a tractor you you're welcome to once again because the idea here is uh, with the implements like once we declare Bobcat standard we can have a bunch of people drawing up a bunch of different implements especially if we say okay these are the accepted motors like for example the PT oh yeah a PTO motor see surplus center Google surplus center and see their PTO motor we need one of those on the back of the tractor what we want to have both on a big track and a micro track well for the micro track the person walks behind so you can't put the PTO there you can put the PTO motor mounted on the front quick attach for the bigger tractor we want a PTO motor on the on the back to run power takeoff driven implements and we want to basically a three-point hitch like mechanism a raise up and down raising mechanism on the back of the bigger tractor but the PTO motor we want to add that to our library so maybe you can draw that up and then we can start fitting it in to different places but with a s small set of uh, approved parts we can now be doing construction set of, of all kinds of tractors okay so I think I gotta get going here and um, so a bunch of different stuff as far as like just just keep your my eyes out like what I do what I do typically and I want to encourage you to do that is if I find somebody on YouTube that's got relevant stuff contact them 
I've been doing that. Like, for example, contacted Brad, who does the path workbench on FreeCAD. Uh, so we're in communication. But contact people and ask them to be subject matter experts if they're doing some real, real design stuff. Like, you see a guy that's, you know, I don't know, someone else who builds tractor implements or something or anything that's relevant. Uh, ask them to join as a... The low level of involvement is as an advisor or an SME where it's just like an hour here and there. But then a heavier level of involvement, of course, is the OSE developers with a heavy commitment. But let's keep going. So anything else? Otherwise, we'll quit here. Oh, Michelle, any, any quick words of inspiration on where you're at? Because of the WebGL stuff, that's really compelling stuff. And, and I was also thinking, just as a final comment on the WebGL stuff, I think what we can do is uh, uh, add augmented reality not in a not-too-distant future. So, for example, what we could do, the simple augmented reality app would be where, upon preparation of workshop layout of materials, we can, put, we can uh, just stick a little sticker on a piece of material that would be a QR code. You take a picture of that with uh, your cell phone, and it tells you meta information about that. It would superimpose information on your cell phone regarding, hi, this is the frame tube member of the tractor. Here's how you put it together. You know, you can, you can put meta content or augmented reality content once you recognize something in real life. So that what I'd like to see that in workshops, people got cell phones, their own cell phones. They got our augmented reality app and what they do is when they're building something, they take a picture of the QR code and then they get information about that, how to do something. And I think that could streamline a lot of the, the build process. I think that's something that's not too far away. It's just programming up um, some basic augmented reality where scanning of QR codes that's readily available. And then you just, you know, scan a QR code, play a video, you know, or, or superimpose video over what you see on a screen, uh, things like that. So... Uh, that's something to watch out for. If, if you guys find any augmented reality programmers, uh, we can definitely use them on a team. Because this is, I mean, this is something that someone can take on right now. Someone can take our tractor parts. Um, you know, we can do the do this software, but it would also require content. It would mean that someone would have to come here, say we're building a tractor, or we do it at one of the events, you know, like Saudi Arabia or here in a month. We, we take video during the event, which is then put into the augmented reality app to, to provide the meta information on the different build steps. So stuff like that could be very compelling. Uh, but Michel, any, anything to uh, add on uh, WebGL? Because that makes me think of WebGL and like all this, it's like augmented reality. Uh, well, I've been working on the, the Blender add-on, uh, mostly uh, studying... Blender uh, add-on for... To, uh, back up a little bit. Blender add-on for generating what? Uh, for um, automating the explosion view uh, models. Yes, okay. So, so um, I figured out how to uh, automate uh, the explosion. Just by one click you explode the model and then you can write uh, the code. Uh, into a file that is usable, but it's uh, it's in an early stage, but I'm I'm getting somewhere. Uh, uh, do you think in this one-click explosion add-on would it be possible to take FreeCAD? You you do the one-click explosion within your Blender, and then you can import it back into FreeCAD to do other stuff with it. Um, or is maybe. that? You could import it as a, an OBG file, probably, but uh -huh. um, not as a as a FreeCAD uh, as as a FreeCAD file. That uh, that being possible for the moment. Okay, because what uh, could be especially for for the WebGL. So and, yeah, uh, and Blender, you import the FreeCAD model, then by, uh, with one click you can explode it, and uh, you write uh, you can write away the. the the positioning information in the other script that can be used in the in the WebGL, so it um, it really speeds up the whole process. Yeah, it will be yeah it will be interesting. Like once you do that, uh, it would be very useful because one thing we have to crack within FreeCAD 
is to do a complete exploded part diagram. While there are exploded part animations, there's really no... Um, why do we need FreeCAD for that? Well, I, I, I brought that up la last week, I know, because... But, but I was working with Michael and I'm not yeah. quite sure why we well, how would you do it? need FreeCAD for that part. How because would you do it? Because we can actually blend out uh, singular parts in the in the exploded part diagram and then show it part by part if we need it. So you're saying the workflow is you is you take it and manually you you split all the parts? Yeah, but basically we we have just um, we take a free cat, put it into or, or automatically make make it be a macro. That's what I was thinking. That actually takes it into Blender, exports it from Blender into an HTML file. You can just double click, and then you have your thing that you can with a slide make to an exploded part diagram if you need it. Um, Michel, are you aware of this discussion? You, that's your discussion, or is this new to you? Uh, yeah, we. we uh, um, sorry, I, I was just busy with. Uh, I wanted right. to, to demonstrate the the, the add-on as it is, and I just lost the, the conversation for the. Oh, so, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Christian, are you talking to Michelle about this? Yeah, yeah, we were working okay, together. Okay. I was working him, with him on the JavaScript. I was well, optimizing. The Right. Well, the the only reason why I say within FreeCAD is, if if you want to go the next step after that, so say you do like like automated, exploded part diagram, what you also want to do, is from that generate, a hyperlinked, HTML or some other document that becomes a hyperlinked, bill of materials. You can either do a, basically a. A table where you can click on a part so within FreeCAD you actually put in the links and you can display them either automatically display a whole BOM table with hyperlinks or you do actual a visual exploded part diagram where you can click and order right from that as well so it'll send you right to so something like whichever way we get it uh, it'll be good but the simple thing I was thinking from for instruction manuals like say it's a printed copy you just have black and white Everything exploded, everything with numbers, and then a table that, that shows what all the parts are. So all those things, somehow we got to get them, whichever way is the easiest way. So if you guys are on top of that, um, that's good. But it's just something we want to think about. Altogether, we absolutely need good capacity to make full exploded part diagrams that go into printed documents. And then also we want to do web-based, WebGL, and other hyperlink documents with other meta information. But yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll work this all out. Yep. Okay. Well, that sounds good. It so yeah. sounds like you guys are doing great progress and um, things yeah, are going. Stuff out of time, uh... Yeah. Excellent. Okay, guys. Well, um, if that's it, then we'll take it away till tomorrow. Uh, and and then next time meeting is going to be next Tuesday. So Connie's going to join us again to talk more about human resources and how to recruit. So thanks a lot and keep going. And the meeting tomorrow, Ahmed, see you, 2 p.m. All right, bye-bye. Okay, see you later. See you. See you.